A rebuke for Washington from both allies and adversaries with the UN's vote on Jerusalem. The US president threatened nations who didn't support him over Israel. The vast majority didn't. So what impact will this have on diplomacy in the Middle East and beyond? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Hashim Ahlbarra. It was a stinging rebuke. 128 countries voting against the United States, only eight standing with it. The subject was President Trump's recognition of Jerusalem as Israel's capital. Both Trump and the U.S. ambassador to the U.N., Nikki Haley, issued threats ahead of Thursday's vote, presenting it as a loyalty test for America's allies and those countries receiving U.S. aid. We begin with Mike Hanna of the U.N. Entitled State the two-thirds majority is comfortably reached. This vote, too, a sweeping repudiation of President Trump's unilateral action in recognizing Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. The result heralded by the apparent isolation of the U.S. delegation in the chamber and the enthusiastic welcome given to the Palestinians, whose foreign minister addressed the assembly and insisted that Jerusalem would be the capital of a Palestinian state. We meet today not because of any animosity towards the US, but because of its decision, which constitutes an aggression on the genuine and natural right of the Palestinian people to the city of Jerusalem. The Israeli ambassador holding up a 2,000-year-old coin as evidence of Israel's claim to the city. It proves the ancient connection of Jews to Jerusalem. Togo, Honduras and Guatemala joined the six nations that had voted against a similar resolution affirming Jerusalem's status last month. And the number of abstentions increased from 9 to 35, this perhaps a result of the threats made by the U.S. to retaliate financially against those who voted in favor. This is bullying and this chamber will not bow to do that. It is unethical to think that the words and dignity of member states are for sale. Let me put it in this way. We will not be intimidated. You can be strong, but it, this doesn't make you right. Dismissive U.S. reaction during the Turkish foreign minister's speech and the ambassador once again adopted a threatening tone in her response. The United States will remember this day in which it was singled out for attack in the General Assembly for the very act of exercising our right as a sovereign nation. We will remember it when we are called upon to once again make the world's largest contribution to the United Nations. There are questions now about the future of U.S.-led attempts to renew negotiations, particularly as the Palestinian leadership insists it will not talk to U.S. representatives in the light of President Trump's decision. The U.S. ambassador claimed the vote could determine the way in which U.S. citizens view the United Nations. In reality, though, the result reflects a global condemnation of President Trump, his strategy and his policies. Mike Hanna, Al Jazeera, United Nations. The reaction to the vote was swift and it highlights how the issue became not just Jerusalem, but America's role in the world. In a statement, Turkey's president said, the world is bigger than five and much bigger than one. A reference to the US veto of a similar resolution earlier this week in the Security Council. Palestine's ambassador to the UN summed up Ivan saying the administration made the issue about them, not about Israel. They used unprecedented tactics, including blackmail and extortion. They, in my opinion, offended the entire international community. Let's bring in our panel. From Washington, D.C., Robert Hunter, a former U.S. ambassador to NATO. In Blackburn, in the U.K., Simon Mebon, a lecturer in international relations and government at Lancaster University. Also in Washington, D.C., Phyllis Bennis, the director of the New Internationalism Project at the Institute for Policy Studies. Welcome to you all. My first question to Mr. Hunter, I would like to ask you this. Was it worth 
to take the fight to the United Nations when everyone knew that this is going to end with an embarrassing outcome for the United States of America? Well, apparently the president uh, didn't care, uh, nor does Mrs. Haley, uh, uh, the UN uh, ambassador, care. Uh, they're both appealing to a domestic U.S. Uh, audience, which is composed uh, both of uh, uh, a number of leaders of the American Jewish community and a number of leaders of the, uh, of the Christian uh, uh, evangelical community. Uh, they don't really care about world opinion uh, in this or in, in most other things. So you have to see it, I think, almost entirely in U.S. Uh, d uh, domestic terms. Ms. Bennis, from a uh, purely American perspective, I mean, I can't see the rationale here for a president to take a decision based on an attempt to appeal to a, a, a domestic base when the outcome could be devastating for the U.S. foreign policy. That's been absolutely consistent for this administration. The notion, I think Robert Hunter is absolutely right, that this was very much aimed at a U.S. domestic audience. The concern is not what happens in the United Nations, but how to use the United Nations and antagonism to the United Nations to whip up support from these right-wing constituencies that they are trying to build here in the United States. It's a very dangerous game that they're playing. The uh, opposition was not simply opposition to the U.S. move uh, around Jerusalem. It was a much broader expression of outrage towards United States bullying of the U.N. and U.N. member states. The Trump administration is not the first in U.S. history to do this kind of bullying. Some of the language was very reminiscent to uh, similar threats and bribes and punishments that were issued by mm -hmm. the Bush administrations, both, both President Bush's, uh, when they could not get the support they wanted for wars against Iraq in 1990 and then again in 2003. But the difference here was the blatant nature of it. The, when President Trump was willing to say, we don't care, specifically those were his words, we don't care about the impact of cutting aid on these impoverished nations if they dare to vote against the United States. That's a real expression of absolute disdain for the rest of the world. And I think there will be retaliation that will go beyond this particular vote. Uh, speaking of the retaliation, Mr. Mebon, do you think that Trump will be able to move forward and deliver on the threats against the nations that voted against his decision to recognize Jerusalem as Israel's capital? Well, I think he'll probably try to do that. I think both he and his uh, ambassador to the United Nations have been very explicit in their desire to do so. And for them not to follow through would, would be seen to be weak to, uh, to those domestic audiences. But I think internationally, there, there has been this, this show of disdain for, for member states of the United Nations, but it also comes across with a real arrogance. This sense of the US just doesn't care what happens. It's got its own agenda. And, and that real arrogance will have a massive impact on how other states engage with it and the types of relations that, that a whole host of other member states who had been uh, engaged in positive relationships with the US, but will now think, think carefully as to, um, to what type of relations it wants. Mm -hmm. Mr. Hunter, you served as an ambassador to NATO. We know that Trump is not a big fan of global governance institutions like the United Nations or NATO. Do you think that this episode will further deepen the tension between Trump and the UN, which has always considered as an inefficient social club? Well, there has long been a feeling among a number of Americans, not the informed Americans, that somehow uh, the United Nations, which is located in the United States, uh, is not uh, pro-American. So Trump is appealing to that particular view. Uh, I think one has to also see this in perspective. This is not a terribly important vote in terms of American standing in the world. Most people here and most people in the world won't even pay attention because it's, it comes on top, as uh, the other speakers have already said, of other things the United States has done under the Trump administration to show disdain for institution uh, disdain for countries that believe in the rule of law, disdain for people who have long looked up to the United States, uh, to use the uh, phrase uh, that's so often used here, mm -hmm. of being a shining uh, city on the hill. So this, this is the tip of a, of a very big iceberg. And uh, if it had happened on its own, that would be one thing. But this merely confirms mm -hmm. uh, in the minds of a lot of people that... Uh, Mr. Trump just doesn't care. Ms. Bennis, the reason why I'm asking this question is basically because 
post Second War uh, World, uh, the international order was based on this idea of international cooperation where all the, those institutions will come together, like the NATO, like the UN. Um, do you see that Trump is trying to challenge this whole international establishment? Well, I think that there's no question that the Trump goal is a very broadly defined America first, this notion that only American interests matter, and that, as he said yesterday, we don't care what happens to the rest of the world. I do think it's important to recognize that the, this post-World War II structure that you speak of was not exactly designed for the whole world. The vast majority of the world's population in the Global South, in Africa, in, in Latin America, in most of Asia, were not included in the United Nations originally. Mm -hmm. NATO was not designed to bring in the whole world. It was designed to keep the Russians out, the Germans down, and the Americans in, as people used to say. Mm -hmm. So it was very much a Cold War product, as was the United Nations in many ways. Mm -hmm. So I think that we, we do have to be... Uh, not naive about how we view the UN, but certainly this is the administration that despite years of antagonism and domination of the UN carried out by the United States, mm -hmm. it was after all Madeleine Albright, uh, Clinton's ambassador to the UN, who said the famous words, the United Nations is a tool of American foreign policy. Mm -hmm. So this goes way back, but there has never been an administration that took it as far as this, that was as rude and as overt as this. Mm -hmm. No other president said the words, we don't care in mm -hmm. talking about the rest of the world. Uh, That's profoundly important in how the rest of the world sees the United States. Mr. Mebon, it was also interesting to see both Trump and uh, Haley saying that we will be watching votes and then we will take decisions accordingly. We've seen yesterday the reactions from Pakistan, from Turkey, from different countries lashing out at the United States of America for what they consider to be very sure. humiliating uh, uh, threats. Is this something which is likely to damage U.S. bilateral relations with many countries, some of which have very important roles in the world? Quite possibly, yeah. I think that the, the, what this um, what this decision and this rhetoric has done is, is really brought relations out to the fo to the uh, to the fore to the really important point where they can be renegotiated on the basis of, of trust, mistrust, concern as to what the real aspirations are amongst the various parties, and and particularly with regard to some of these really key actors such as Turkey, such as Pakistan, they now have heard the president of the United States saying that they don't care. About, about their issues, about the international affairs. And, of course, the U.S. has played a, a long uh, negotiating position within the, uh, the so-called peace process, which many would take issue with as, as not really going anywhere, not going anywhere quickly. But now the U.S. has taken a side on that. And that, too, will have a massive impact on U.S. relations with a number of states who have already recognized Palestine as a state. Mr. Ter Hunter, I mean would like to move just beyond what happened at the United Nations General Assembly. Now, if you look at the reactions from countries in Latin America, Europe, including major U.S. allies like France and the U.K., the Middle East and Asia, you get this feeling that people are now having questions about uh, the U.S. leadership. Do you see that this could be a prelude to a change in the way people perceive of the U.S. influence in the, in the, in, in the world? Well, I think that's already been happening over the last year. Uh, this, uh, to use a metaphor, is only the icing uh, on the cake. Mm -hmm. uh, what I think needs to be done now uh, in the United States is finally, finally, to get some kind of coherent policy towards the Middle East, which simply doesn't exist. This is only one element of, of, of incoherence. Secondly, uh, let's, let's recognize in the, in the peace process that one of the outcomes that has always been understood is that Israel would have its capital in Jerusalem. But also understood is that there would be a Palestinian state with its capital in Jerusalem. Uh, frankly, I can see a virtue for uh, various countries in the world rather than uh, doing what they just did to condemn the United States, which uh, we obviously know this was uh, an, an expression of displeasure going way behind this, uh, beyond this issue. I think there ought to also be a number of countries who say, well, Jerusalem will also be the capital of a Palestinian state, and we will recognize it right now. Uh, one of the interesting things about this, if this entire Jerusalem issue were left just to the people who lived there, they'd figure out how to do it. They figured this, it out 20, yes. 30 years ago. <laughs> uh, two, capi two, capitals in, two, uh, two, two capitals in one city. Uh, they can work it out.
but this, but this again sends very confusing messages. And let me go now to uh, Miss Bernice. I mean, so this is a move that comes at a time when the Americans are saying they have been working towards what they consider to be the ultimate deal in Palestine. The way I see it, this is, not, this is going nowhere. It certainly is going nowhere. There is no peace process underway, and there hasn't been all year. There have been some negotiations between Jared Kushner and the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia, and that little bromance between Jared and Mohammed is mainly focused on building a region-wide coalition against Iran. And the hope has been that they will be able to figure out a way to normalize relations between Saudi Arabia and Israel to bring Israel into that coalition. In order to do that, to pacify Arab public opinion and even Arab governments that are concerned about the, their population being outraged at such a thing, as long as Israel is occupying Palestinian land, they needed to show that there were peace talks of some sort underway, that the Palestinians are okay, they're going to be taken care of, Israel is no longer a problem, we can normalize against the big enemy, which is Iran. That has now been made much more difficult by this move around Jerusalem, which goes again to the internal domestic politics of the Trump administration. Mm -hmm. But I think that we have to see this in the context of 25 years of failure of U.S. supposed leadership on this issue. That leadership has led to nothing. And there now is, I think, for most analysts who actually look at conditions on the ground, there is no way a two-state solution is going to happen. Mm -hmm. It's not about who wants it. It's not up to me to say whether there should be one state or two states, red mm -hmm. state, blue state. That's not up to me. I'm from the United States. I don't live there. Mm -hmm. But with Israel having now sent 650,000 illegal settlers into Palestinian territory, mm -hmm. there is no contiguous territory available to create a state. So the, the notion that there's going to be a state, there's going to be two capitals for two states, is simply not such a given. It's one of many possibilities, and it's by far not the most likely right now. So I think that we have to go back to international law that says Jerusalem is a separate body. It's not part of either Israel it's a final or a Palestinian status state. Issue. It is a corpus separatum. Mm -hmm. Mr. It's a Mebon. final status issue, exactly. Mm -hmm. Mr. Mebon, I mean, if you look at the situation right now, I mean, if there's been this attempt to create a deal, a, a non-conventional -conven way led by Jared sure. Kushner, but you see the backlash in the Arab and Muslim world. People now no longer believe the Americans are honest brokers. Uh, there is a new dynamic in the region. Yep. There is Turkey, which is seen as uh, spearheading efforts to save the Palestinians. Isn't this something which is likely to pose massive challenges for the Americans in the near future. Yeah, I think so. I think that, that if we look at the peace process, this is sort of 25 years after the Oslo Accords, after the, the so-called roadmap was being put into place to bring about a peace between the Israelis and the Palestinians. This has gone nowhere. But the main mediator within this, within all of the talks, within the dialogue, is the US. And the US has now taken sides, seemingly, within the, uh, the whole negotiating process. So it's going to be incredibly difficult for the US to move forward with any type of formal negotiations because for, for many of the Palestinian factions, the US has now picked a side. It's moved its, its embassy, or it will move its embassy to Jerusalem, which changes facts on the ground. Mm -hmm. Palestinians in East Jerusalem will see that there is a U.S. embassy there. It will be a symbolic status, and it will have a massive impact on the ability to mediate, to transform conflict, and to actually bring about some kind of resolution. And that, of course, will have a massive impact across the world. Arab populations, uh, Arab civil society groups are largely against Israelis, against mm -hmm. the state of Israel. Um, the, the quantitative surveys done by the Arab Barometer, the Arab Human uh, Development Report, all suggests that Arab populations are staunchly against the state of Israel. Okay. And so this will have a massive impact. And states such as Turkey, states such as Iran, have become empowered by this. And their, their narratives of resistance, their narratives of challenging the U.S., challenging Israel, have only been empowered by this move. Okay. Now, Mr. Hunter, as the general, as the anti-American sentiment is on the rise in the Arab and Muslim world, America is no longer seen as a reliable partner. We've seen countries like the French, Francois, uh, Emmanuel Macron now stepping in, visiting Saudi Arabia, the Gulf region. Uh, he met with uh, Palestinian uh, leader Mahmoud Abbas. Are the French trying to take advantage of this situation and position themselves as sort of replacement or substitute to the Americans in the region? Well, it used to be said that these countries were irrelevant 
because only the United States uh, was big enough, strong enough, and engaged enough uh, to be able to do something. Uh, I think the United States, as we're saying here, has kind of marginalized itself uh, in this in entire process. But that doesn't mean that anybody else can do it. The fundamental issue here is whether Israel uh, is prepared to cede a major portion, not all, of the West Bank uh, to an independent Palestinian state. Uh, the answer is no. Uh, now, it is true that there are 650,000, whatever the number is, of, of settlers, but some of those are within territory which in all the negotiations would become part of Israel in land swaps. But the idea that any Israeli government, and certainly not this one, would be willing to have those other settlers mm -hmm. uh, who are illegal by any standard uh, and would be illegal under a final uh, settlement to remove them, that's mm -hmm. also nonsense. And I think the point was well put that what is really going on here is an effort by the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia and a number of Israelis uh, to forge a coalition against Iran and in the process to crush the Palestinians. Yes, but you know, Mr. Hunter, the problem uh, the with this... The Palestinians are... With whatever this, happens there are the big losers. Yeah, big but, the, losers. you know, the problem with this is that the Arab world of now is not the Arab world of 20 years ago. I mean, now, you, you, you see the reaction on the streets. I mean, there's absolutely no way they would tolerate anything which is seen by the Muslims and the Arabs as a betrayal. Um, Mr. Beniz, now... For the last 60 or 70 years, the Americans were very instrumental in any major peace deal in the region. Don't you think that this could be now a prelude for other countries to step in? Russia, the UK, or France? I think that there's very much a possibility, if there were political will. I think we should be clear that despite the, the positions of Arab governments, people in the Arab world have long understood that the U.S. was never an honest broker in these talks. It was never an honest broker. That's not new. And it's understood to be not new across the region, certainly for Palestinians, but for people across the region as well. One of the U.S. longtime negotiators said in his book, we acted as Israel's lawyers. Mm -hmm. And most of us knew that. It wasn't acknowledged. It still isn't acknowledged. The problem for the Arab regimes is that they want to consolidate their relations with the United States. They mostly want to normalize relations with Israel if they thought they could get away with it. So the question is, who else might move into this breach in that moment? And the question then becomes, which of the major powers? It could be Russia, in the sense that Russia mm -hmm. has played a more active role in the Middle East, not always a good one. It could be the, the European Union as a whole, which has enormous uh, economic pressure it could bring to bear on Israel because of massive trade relations. It could be the United Nations, which and should this, be the, both the venue and the major player for these kinds of talks. And this brings the question, and let me go to Mr. Uh, Mebon. Mr. Mebon, whatever happens, whatever the outcome in the near future, or whoever will take over, don't you think that the peace process, which was moribund for quite some time, now could take advantage of the changing dynamics in the world and become at the forefront of the international diplomatic flurry to sort out this problem? Very briefly, please. I certainly hope that it, it does take on that, that prominent role, but I fear that it will be sacrificed to much stronger geopolitical trends. This rising uh, framing of Iran as the greatest existential threat to peace in the Middle East, to uh, domestic pressures in the US. The UK has, has not got the political capital or the desire to get involved because of the Brexit crisis. The Russians have got invested in Syria and they're particularly concerned with that. So I fear that although there is a great deal of anger, a great deal of concern as to the Palestinian cause, as well there should be, it's going to be, again, a political football to be kicked around different peoples who want to gain a bit of political capital at a particular time. And it's the Palestinian people, the people of East Jerusalem, the Palestinian Jerusalemites, mm -hmm. who are going to be paying the heaviest price as settlement buildings, both legal and illegal in, in, in Israeli law, but fully illegal in international law, continues to happen. We'll have to leave it there, Mr. Mabon. Mr. Hunter and Ms. Benny's, thank you very much indeed for your time. And thank you too for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page, that's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. For me, Hashim Ahlbala and the whole team here. Bye for now.